Truth Espresso, episode 27. Face it, we all would rather sleep in this morning. <sighs> That's why God gave us espresso to kickstart our zombified corpses into hyperdrive. <laughs> And now, giving your mind and soul the morning shot of truth it craves. This is Truth Espresso with Daniel Minnick. Is the doctrine of Jesus Christ as God incarnate necessary for Christmas? And is an incarnation required for salvation? Hi, I am Daniel Minnick, and welcome to Truth Espresso. I am continuing a series discussing Christmas, but I'm not really going through the Christmas story. I'm not really reading through Matthew's and Luke's Gospels and looking just at the narratives there. I am going through the theology of Christmas, and I really hope that understanding the theology of Christmas can make Christmas really shine in your hearts, can really encourage you. If you're a Christian listening to this podcast, I really want you to understand that the doctrine of Christmas is more than just pretty lights, more than just decorating trees. It's more than just having holiday cheer and being generous and giving gifts. While all of that is fine and dandy, as long as that's not what Christmas is all about to you, but that it's more than that, that it's recognizing who Jesus Christ is and why he came. It's not just about a cute baby that was had a lowly birth. It's not just about someone mighty. It's about God incarnate, and it's really about understanding what that means. And why is he God incarnate? Why would he have to be God incarnate? Could salvation happen in any other way than for Christmas to happen? And that's why I want us to understand that the incarnation and understanding who Jesus Christ is, what Jesus is by nature, and how a true incarnation is absolutely essential for salvation. And how this isn't just about saying that we love Jesus and worship Jesus, and even just that we say he's God. What does all that mean? And why is it important to grasp just what that means? If you're just listening to this episode, I would strongly recommend that you listen to the last few episodes Listen to episode 24, The Godness of God. Listen to episode 25, The Trinity Demystified. Listen to episode 26, Christmas and Incarnation. And those will really provide the foundation for this episode as we, mo- as we look closely about the theology of Incarnation. In the last episode, we talked about what incarnation is not and what incarnation is. In this episode, I want to look at my favorite passage of Scripture and see that the incarnation of Jesus Christ as God in human form is absolutely integral to how salvation is brought about, how God gives us salvation and forgives sins. This passage in Philippians chapter 2 is often called the Carmen Christi. Some scholars believe that this passage of Scripture is actually the words to an ancient hymn sung to Christ as to God. Now, it may or may not have been a song, but it is certainly just as beautiful enough to be put to music and be a song, even if it wasn't. But I'm going to read this passage, and we're really going to dig deep into it. We're going to parse some of these words carefully, look at their meaning, see how they're used in the sentences. And I hope that doesn't scare you, 
because I think this is really a wonderful way to look at this passage. I hope that by listening to this episode and reading the passage yourself again, you will go away from this episode appreciating this passage from Philippians chapter 2 like you've never appreciated it before. So I am going to read Philippians chapter 2 and verses 3 through 11. The Apostle Paul, talking to the Philippian church, says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, or emptied himself, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And that is the passage from Philippians chapter 2, called the Carmen Christi. So, this passage tells us something about Jesus Christ. And, of course, there are different people who call themselves Christians that I would mention in the last episode who will try to interpret this passage differently than the way we have as an orthodox interpretation throughout church history. And this passage, I suggest, strongly, clearly teaches an incarnation Christology, that Jesus is truly the incarnation of the divine Son of God. So what is the context, and how will this help us? Well, the context of this passage is humility. Remember, in verses 3 through 4, the Apostle Paul is telling Christians, let each esteem other better than themselves. So we are equal to each other. We are all fellow human beings, and we are all redeemed by the blood of Christ. We are all equal to each other, but we should lower ourselves to serve others. And Christ is given as our example. We are to have the mind of Christ, according to verse 5. Jesus is said to be equal with God in verse 6, but he emptied himself in verse 7. Our Savior is our example. Those who claim that verse 6 is not really saying that Jesus is equal with God in nature miss the point of the passage, and I will explain that. If we are to esteem each other better than our own self, as verse 3 tells us, that means we are equal in our standing in the body of Christ and as fellow human beings. Yet, we are to lower ourselves to submit to our equals. Jesus, who did not grasp being equal with God, lowered himself through the Incarnation by becoming obedient unto death. This means that he obeyed the Father's will to keep the law and die as our substitute. He cannot be our example, and we cannot have the mind of Christ in us if this parallel of humility does not hold. And so, humility as the context is absolutely vitally important to understand the Christology, to understand the identity of Jesus Christ as espoused in this passage. 
So let's dig in to some of the words and phrases and how they are used in this song to Christ as to God. So let's look at verse 6, who being in the form of God. We could also word this lexically from the Greek as saying, the one in the form of God being. Let's look at some of these words. What does it mean by form of God? Well, the word form in the Greek is the word morphe, which means shape, or it could also mean features as perceived through the senses or in the mind. And so I would suggest that when we're talking about this form, we're not referring to a literal shape, but we're talking about how our minds understand the nature of God. This is referring to a thought about the nature of God. And so the phrase form of God. Now, what does of God here mean? In the Greek, that phrase is the word theou. This is a genitive case noun, and the genitive case means the case of a noun that makes it act as a modifier or it relates to another noun. So, form is the antecedent, and of God, theou, is the genitive that's modifying the word form. So, what does it mean, form of God? How does this of God relate to the word form? Is it the source? Is it the possession? Or is it even the output? Like, say, does it mean that the form was created by God? Does it mean that the form is something that God merely possesses? Or is it referring to a type, like it, this is God's divine form? There are many ways genitive case nouns can tell us about how it relates to another noun, but usually the context makes it clear, and that would make it a genitive of specification, in my understanding. It tells us that this form is the divine form. It is the nature of God, so the form of God really means the nature of God, his divinity, his divine attributes, his infinite eternal form as we can understand it in our mind. So, we're still looking at this phrase, who being in the form of God. What does it mean that Jesus being in the form of God? The word being in the Greek is the word huparkon. It is a present active participle in the Greek. Well, what does that mean? Well, I think this is important to some of the theology or the Christology being presented here. Who being in the form of God. This present active participle means that Jesus is being in the form of God. He didn't used to be. He is being. Whatever he did later on in this passage, he did while being in the form of God. So, he did something later in the passage, and I would argue that he is still being in the form of God. Let's move on to the next phrase. So, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God? Or we could reword this to say, he did not rule or consider to cling or grasp or seize to be equal with God. So let's look at that. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The word thought, or we could say considered, is the Greek word hegesita. And I like this word because it means a sovereign consideration, a sovereign ruling so Jesus, as God the Son and co-equal in the Trinity with the Father, was not under an authoritarian command of the Father to become incarnate. It was something the Son considered sovereignly. He dictated it. He ruled it. He considered it. He thought it sovereignly. This is important to the context of humility. This was not something that the father barked down to the son and the son had to submit 
Okay, Father, I'll become incarnate. I have no choice. No, this was the Son's choice, and the Son had all the power to consider it and carry it out, and the Father did not hammer it down to him. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Not robbery? Or, we could say, not to grasp or cling or seize. In the Greek, this is the, the phrase, uk harpagmon. Does this mean that Jesus considered equality with God something that wasn't his by nature, and that he realized that he shouldn't try to assume it? If that were true, that would kind of make him like Lucifer. You know, the guy who says, I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will be like the Most High. And to say that, you know, Jesus just knew his place, that God was above him. And so it was humility for him not to try to make himself equal with God. Or we could read this another way. Uk Harpagman could mean that he does possess equality with God by nature, but he chose not to cling on to it as a right or as a privilege that he had. Once again, I think the context of humility tells us that this is something Jesus has by nature. He does possess by nature all rights and privileges of being equal with God. But he chose not to exercise that in a certain way for the purpose of humility. Remember the mind of Christ. Remember that we each should esteem other better than himself. So if I need to esteem you as better than me, and yet you also need to esteem me as better than you, and each of us tries to lower himself... What does that say about each of us? That we're equal. And so if we are to have the mind of Christ and the context is humility and that Christ did not grasp at equality with God, it was not something he had to grasp or cling to, then this was an act of humility by which he lowered himself under what he, what he possessed. Okay, so let's get to that phrase equal with God. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He thought not equality with God something to be grasped or held on to. So the phrase equality with God in the Greek is hisatheu. This means what it clearly says, equal with God. But in what sense is this equality with God being expressed? So the context is about humility, remember? Perhaps the equality here has to do with the rights and privileges afforded by the nature. If a king decides to put on street rags and beg for food with the paupers, his nature didn't change, he's still the king, but he is foregoing the rights and privileges that he possesses by nature. I think this is what is meant by equal with God. Jesus, while being in the form of God, didn't jealously grasp the rights and privileges afforded him that goes with that form of God, but rather he humbled himself. So let's move on to verse 7. But made himself of no reputation. This is a long phrase, but basically it literally means, but emptied himself. The word for emptied here in the Greek is the word ekenosen, emptied. Now, the Apostle Paul always uses this word in a metaphoric sense. It doesn't mean that the Son rid himself of divine attributes. He didn't remove anything from his possession. It means that he suppressed the exercise of divine privileges due his nature. Remember, the context is humility and the mind of Christ. And so that helps us to understand how some of these words are being used. 
if the context is also the Apostle Paul's use of kanao, the infinitive form of the Greek word, and this is the form of the word ekanosin in this passage, Paul never uses this word emptied in any of his writings to mean losing something. It means suppressing. So Jesus suppressed, he emptied himself by suppressing himself. And now we move on to the next phrase, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now those were two clauses. I want to put those two clauses together and I want to briefly discuss both of those parts because there are two parallel things here. Remember, we have an action verb from Jesus that ekenosin, that he emptied himself. And now we have two clauses that I believe are telling us how he emptied himself. They're modifying the verb. They are adverbs. So the first phrase, and took upon him the form of a servant, could also literally be worded, the form of a servant taking. Yes, taking. It's a participle. And then the second clause, and was made in the likeness of men, can be literally worded, and of the like form of humanity being made. There is another participle there. Remember, Jesus as the Son emptied himself, and these two clauses here tell us how he emptied himself. They function as adverbs. So let's start with the first clause and took upon him the form of a servant, or taking on the form of a servant. So what does it mean by form of a servant? In the Greek, that's morphendulu. This clearly designates the type of the form. I mean, we're not saying that some servant somewhere created a form. No, this, this form is the servant type of form. This is why I believe that form of God in the previous verse must mean that God is the type of the form, because servant is the type of this form. There is a parallel here which helps us know how both of these genitives of God and of servant are being used. There is clearly a parallel, so If form of a servant means that servant is the type of the form, then form of God means that God is the type of the form there. And so, while Jesus was being in the form of God, he emptied himself. And one of the ways he emptied himself is by taking on the form of a servant. So, let's look at that word taking. The word in the Greek is labon. This is a participle. Everywhere this word is used in the Bible, a form of this word, it means to grab something into one's possession. It never means to replace something. Therefore, this is key to understand that this is an incarnation passage. Remember, one person with two natures. There has always been one person, one who under discussion in this passage, the one who, who is being in the form of God, emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. This is one person with two forms or two natures. Now let's look at the second clause that modifies emptied himself. So he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, and he also emptied himself by being made in the likeness of men. So let's look at what it means by the likeness of men. The word likeness is the Greek word homoiomati, or like form. Now, before the Gnostics jump up and down and shout, Hallelujah, we have been vindicated, this does not mean that he only looked or felt human like the Gnostics would teach. It means that his human form was in every way like ours. It was fully human. 
Remember, we are all distinct individual human beings. So, while the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are homoousios with each other, you know, I'll probably get into that word in another episode. They are of the same nature with each other. Jesus would be homoiomati with us because he was just as human as we, but he didn't inhabit the exact same individual human body as some other human person possessed. He was his own distinct human being. He didn't possess some other human. So he is in every way like us in humanity. He had a like form. His human nature is just like our human nature. It's not a different thing. It didn't only appear to be human. It didn't just feel or talk or act human. It truly was human. So in the likeness of men, of men in the Greek, anthropon. You might be familiar with that word, like anthropology, the study of humanity. So truly, his form of a servant, though miraculously conceived and virgin-born, is fully human. So in the likeness of men, he was being made. Being made here is the Greek word genomenos. This is also a participle. So, there are two instrumental participles, one from each of these clauses. So, taking the form of a servant, labon, and being made in the likeness of men, genomenos, these two are what we would call instrumental participles or participles of means. They tell us how a verb is carried out. And so, remember, Akenosin emptied himself. He emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant and by being made in a fully human form, a humanity that would be conceived, develop, grow, and die by crucifixion. He did this voluntarily. So, to sum up this beautiful passage, remember, this is my favorite passage of Scripture. We, as equals, as Christians, should submit ourselves under each other to humble ourselves and serve each other. Our example is Christ, and we should have the mind of Christ. Christ, who was being in the nature of God, didn't cling jealously to the rights and privileges that being divine affords him, but rather he emptied himself. How? By taking on a humble form of a servant and being made human, he did this while still being in the form of God. This means that Jesus was the one person of the divine Son of God with two full natures, divine and human. And that really is what Christmas is all about. That's what that birth of the babe in the manger is all about. He is the incarnation of God the Son. And Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 11, the Carmen Christi, as we see Christ was born in a stable, in a manger, in hay. He was not announced with trumpets blasting as a king in all of his regal majesty would arrive. No, he was born in humility, and the Carmen Christi of Philippians chapter 2 gives us a little insight into the mind of Christ as the eternal Logos, the divine Son, who sovereignly considered making himself of no reputation and emptying himself by taking on humanity and adding that human nature to himself such that he was one person with two natures, and that is incarnation, and that, my friends, is Christmas. Thank you for waking up with Truth Espresso. Good morning, and God bless your day. Hey friends, Daniel Minnick here again. 
If you liked waking up to this episode of Truth Espresso, I would really appreciate it if you would rate it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever application you use to listen to Truth Espresso.